Hey everyone, my name is Amol Kapoor and I'll be opening up the next section of our workshop titled Application Stories. In this section, we're going to be doing a brief overview into a few of the exciting applications of the graph mining library. I'll be opening up, I'll be presenting our recent work using graph neural networks to model COVID-19 caseload predictions. Uh, then Alessandro will take over, he's going to be presenting some of our work in privacy. And John will finish up with a presentation on some of our work in causal inference. The idea behind this section of the workshop is to really get you excited, you know, like we selected some application areas that we think are really cool and we hope they get you thinking about graphs in a new light and, you know, hopefully excited about the rest of this four hour long workshop. So before we begin, I do want to thank all of you guys for tuning in. It's just been such a weird year and I think it's great that we can still find ways to come together and present our work. Um, and that's actually why I think, you know, this initial talk is going to be super relevant, modeling COVID-19 with spatial temporal graph neural networks. I think this is a topic that's like really personal to a lot of people at this point, because it's just so impactful to just about everybody in the world. It's the reason that I can't give this talk to you in person, even though I really would like to. So, you know, hopefully you guys find this talk exciting and engaging. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited to kind of open up this section of the, of, of the workshop. So before we dive into COVID-19 and epidemiology and graph convolutional networks, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about deep learning and why we think deep learning is a really, really powerful tool here. So at its core, a deep ML model is learning some sort of function f of x, where x is some sort of curated feature set. In this case, we have a, you know, a dummy example of shapes and colors. And we pass these shapes and colors, these underlying features, into a stack of linear algebra transformations. And each one of these transformations produces an intermediate state for our deep model. We call these intermediate states embeddings. And these embeddings capture some complex interactions between features in a really high dimensional space. So if you have a lot of features at your input uh, and they correlate with each other in ways that are maybe difficult for a human to understand or even expect, uh, you just throw them into the model and the model is able to project all of these into a 64 or 128 dimensional space and discover the correlations uh, inherent in the underlying data. So these models are then optimized for some sort of a loss, which in turn defines how each intermediate embedding is structured. On the left-hand side, for example, we have a loss that's entirely about color. So that model's intermediate state is going to be surfacing information that's much more related to the feature's color scheme. On the right-hand side, uh, we have a model that's primarily focused on shape. And so that model will end up having an intermediate state that will store information related to the underlying shape of the intermediate features. I think this kind of gets at a uh, underlying reason for why we think deep ML models are so powerful. And that's because you can put anything on either side of a deep ML model and the intermediate state will fill in the blanks. And I think this is really important when you start thinking about these really, really complex things like epidemiology. Uh, when you start thinking about like epidemiology and disease spread, there's so many factors that go into it, right? Like you have the obvious things like the incubation period of the disease or the infectiousness of the disease. But then you also have things like, what's the weather like? What's the underlying population? You know, how old is the underlying population? Has the state instituted lockdown yet? And these other factors that are very, very critical for understanding how disease is spreading through our society, they are very difficult to model through math. You're like, I don't know of a mathematical model for modeling lockdown. And uh, I think as a result, you know, deep learning has this really, really nice ability to process complex disease dynamics and multidimensional data that cannot really be captured by traditional compartmental models. And so we think that deep learning is actually really, really well suited for the general problem of epi epidemiology. So how did we actually go about modeling COVID? Well, our intuition was that epidemiological modeling depends on time and space. The number of cases that a county or a given location has tomorrow is a function of the cases that that county had yesterday and the cases that its neighbors had today. This is fundamentally a multimodal problem. We're dealing with time and space as two of our modalities. And it's fundamentally a graph problem because it's very, very easy to model these different locations as nodes in an underlying mobility graph. So that's exactly what we did. We uh, wanted to use mobility data to create a temporal and spatial graph where the underlying node represents a location and a place in order to understand how people, and by extension COVID, move around. And Google, because it's Google, has some very rich mobility information through aggregated GPS analysis. You know, everybody carries around these smartphones in their pockets. And so we're able to use that in order to understand how people are moving around. And I want to be, you know, very clear about this. We were very privacy conscious about this data. You know, we were very aware that this was extremely sensitive information. So we made sure that all of this information was going to be aggregated and averaged out in such a way that it would be impossible to actually ever identify a single individual from the overall trend. But we still think that the trend is super important and super powerful on its own because it allows us to answer questions like how many people flew from King County, Washington to Queens in a given location or a given month? How many people in L.A. use the subway today? And I think that if you're trying to model, you know, uh, disease dynamics based on how people are coming into contact, these kinds of mobility information are fundamentally critical to understanding how COVID is going to spread through our societies. 
So using the New York Times COVID report data and the Google mobility data at a US county level, we created the spatial temporal graph. Each node represented a time and a place, like we said, and had case counts and intro mobility data as self features. The graph can actually be visualized as 150 slices, where each slice represents a day from January 1st to May 31st of 2020. Edges within each slice are spatial and represented the mobility or the amount of movement, human movement between two counties, while edges between slices were temporal and were inversely weighted based on the amount of time that passed between the edge. So one of the greatest benefits of graph data is that we can incorporate context into our analysis. When analyzing a node, we can surface its neighborhood as a source of information. And if you remember what we said about deep learning at the beginning, the more information that you can provide, the more of these obscure high level correlations the model has access to, the better the model's underlying uh, prediction is gonna be. So GCNs really supercharge this principle by applying deep learning on top of the graph structure. And I'm not going to get into the technical details too much. We actually have an entire section of this workshop just dedicated to the technical details of graph neural networks. But the, suffice to say, we can use a GCN to build a learned hierarchical representation around a given node, which allows us to pull in contextual information that will help us predict node level features, like, for example, COVID case counts. So what we did was we took a GCN and we took this graph that we had constructed, and we trained a model to predict from the last seven days of data what the next day's change in COVID caseload was going to look like. And initial results show that the GNN was able to successfully use this mobility data to predict the next day change better than a lot of the baselines that were previously being used. I think what's really exciting about this was we basically did no hyperparameter tuning or feature engineering when we ran this model. We just took the underlying data, constructed the graph, and ran the model on top. And yet we were still able to achieve a significant reduction in error on the RMSLE and a significant improvement in the Pearson correlation. I think this is really exciting because it kind of lends credence to this idea that if you have a deep ML model that can function on graphs and you have this graph data or this data that can be very easily modeled as graphs, then the GNN is going to be able to outperform just intuitively, it's going to be able to outperform other uh, baselines that don't have access to this information. So this is a visual representation of uh, the model's predictions and the actual ground truth for a given location, in this case, Philadelphia. You can see that the blue prediction line actually trends pretty close to the underlying uh, ground truth, which, I, which is, again, pretty exciting. Uh, and then this is the same data represented as a cumulative count instead of as a delta. So this is predicting the change in case counts in Philadelphia, and this is change predicting the cumulative case count in Philadelphia. Um, so you know, I don't have a ton of time. I, I, I want to leave time for my other two speakers. And you know, I, like I said, we'll be coming back here for more uh, to talk about GNNs later in the, in the workshop. But hopefully, you guys found this exciting. Um, and hopefully, you guys found this engaging. Uh, I want to leave with a few conclusions. First, deep ML models are powerful because they can take arbitrary inputs and learn mappings to requested outputs. This is why we think it's so great for epidemiology, because epidemiology has so many factors that interact in so many weird ways. And deep ML models are really, really capable at extracting the insight from those features. Second, graphs provide a means to incorporate context, which is a powerful source of information for these deep ML models. And GCNs build on top of that context in order to create this unifying deep ML framework. And then finally, these GCNs were, you know, we used them to actually model COVID. And we think that we can actually use them to model a whole suite of other things. We're actually really excited to keep working in the space of epidemiology and health in general. Uh, but, you know, we think that GCNs really uh, represent a powerful tool in the toolbox to tackle all sorts of problems, both in and out of the epidemiological space. And that's it. You know, normally I would love to give a kind of Q&A here. I think we have a little bit of time for live Q&A at the end, but this is a recording, so I can't do it now. Uh, but I do want to give a quick shout out to the other authors who were really instrumental for making this work happen, uh, specifically Sherry Ben. Uh, she was a uh, first author on this paper, and she was you know, part of a different team at Google. So she wasn't able to actually come here and present this work. But this really could not have been done without, without her and without some of these other authors, authors here. So if this work was exciting to you, feel free to check out the paper, Examining COVID-19 Forecasting Using Spatial Temporal Graph Neural Networks. And yeah, I'm really going to be excited to answer some live Q&A, uh, hopefully in a bit. Uh, thanks so much. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference.